unless you've been under a rock for a very long period of time, we are in a very um, strange place in the world right now. And not enough people understand that they have to heal themselves first before we can mm. save this planet. And I thought if, if I get everybody on a, as many people as I can, understanding sound, energy, lifestyle, we can create our freedom. We can actually look and go, all right, my goodness, we need to change this and we need to change this. But actually we can do that because we've changed ourselves. What's up, everybody? I'm your host, Patrick Cook. Welcome to Being. Being is a place where we gather to explore some of life's most difficult questions. What does it mean to lead a meaningful life? What does it mean to live a life of purpose or on purpose? How do we make sense of the world? Really what we're asking is, what the hell is going on? My guest today is a speaker, a voiceover artist, and the founder and creative director of I Am Sound, a subscription-based membership for creatives that teaches people how to use sound, energy, and vibration to enhance both their work and personal lives on a daily basis. This is a super fun and enlightening episode, but please be aware that there is some profanity and we do discuss some mature topics. So, without further ado, I would like to introduce Nat Rich. Welcome to Being. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Yay. So excited to drop in with you. Uh, I first kind of came across you online, and I was drawn to how open and authentic and raw you are. And I just, <laughs> I, I just love that about you. And specifically, um, your willingness to be a catalyst for conversations around awkward topics like sex and sobriety and money. I think it's yeah. so needed in our society right now. And I'm uh, looking forward to diving into all those things with you. But I'd like to start with a, a foundational question and sort of like take it from there. And the question is this, what is your definition of success? And how has it changed over time? So, oh, good. That's a good one. Definition uh -huh. of success. Um, for me, it's waking up feeling happy as often as you can. And before I really knew it was that I was striving and struggling and pushing and climbing and like crying most of the time. And uh, it really, things weren't working for me. And then I realized one of my friends said to me, he said, what are you doing for the day? And I said, you know what? I'm just going to scrap my diary today. I'm just going to get rid of everything and uh, just relax. And he said, do you realize how wealthy you are? And I was like looking at him thinking, what? He said, that's true wealth. I wish with my 14 businesses that I could just take a day off. He said, you have no idea how successful, even though you're not where you think you want to be. Having time and being able to make time for yourself is success. And I thought, wow. And, it, you know, and I truly do wake up happy sometimes knowing that if I need to cancel something, I can. So for me, that's that's my version of success is happiness. Oh, I love that. Yes. Having time, making time for yourself is so, so important. And making time for self-love, whatever that means for you, is so important. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing I read on your website is about goals and how you uh, have decided that no goals is kind of the way you like to operate in your life. How does that work for you? And, you know, what, what does it look like? Um, so the reason being is because when I was striving, when I was pushing and pushing and pushing, things didn't work for me and I would get so far but there would be a major tumble or I would get so far and then there'd be some form of breakdown and that for me was constant it was like having bipolar I could imagine it's going up and going down going up and going down and I realized that I was always in this element of striving always trying mm. to push forward and that wasn't working for me and I remember when I, I I damaged my back, I broke my back, I had two spinal fractures, two slip discs and a twisted pelvis, and I still don't know how it happened. It just, I pretty much woke up one day um, with intense pain where I couldn't move. And I'd had sciatica before that for a few months. And it was just everything had just given up. So when I had to leave Ibiza where I was living, and then I had to come back, uh, come back to London, I remember being in bed at my friend's house, and I was there for almost six months in the end. But he said to me, um, come and chill out, come and stay here, relax. And it was the first time I truly relaxed. And I just sat there and I was like, wow, what am I going to do? I've got nothing. I can't do anything. I can't do the radio show that I had before. There's so many things that I can't achieve right now. And I'm just going to have to give up. And when I gave up, I literally surrendered and thought, I've got no way of getting out of this. I'm just going to have to give it a go. And uh, it was within a week, everything I needed came to me. 
And I was like, this is so strange. Like I'm doing nothing. But what I realized was when you're busy all the time and you're moving consistently and your efforts are so you know, big and so much and it takes so much energy, you don't slow down and it, the universe can't keep up with you. It wants you in a certain place where it can move you and you can flow with it. But if you're not flowing with it, the good things can't necessarily happen to you. You can make them happen, but it's a lot of energy and it's a lot of struggle. Mm -hmm. So by actually removing any goals and any ideas of what I actually want in the future, I thought I'm going to try this for a while and, and have no goals. All I want to do is exist in the day. And I, you know, I, my big goal was, you know, in life, oh, I want to be in the now. And I thought, well, I'm never going to be in the now if I'm constantly tri striving to get somewhere. Mm. So I thought, well, the best I can do is if I try and stay in the day, if not the minute and the moment and, you know, the hour that we're in, if I can stay in the day and not put myself too far forward or try and take myself too far back with my past, then that'll be some kind of achievement. And by doing that for just a few weeks, I slowly started to come into the hour and then into the now and very feeling very present in myself, which I'd never felt before, but it's because I stopped trying to make it somewhere. And I just, I literally gave up in the most normal kind of chilled way. I didn't have any other option and it, it kind of all unfolded, but I just don't think it, we can, I don't think we truly understand until something major happens to us that you know, we really do have the power and we can stop running around like headless chickens at any time and when we sit down it's like the universe goes yes there you are mm. and it can look after you it can serve you absolutely it's beautiful so that that idea of surrender and coming into alignment with ourselves i think is so it, it's it's somewhat counterintuitive especially in our western culture of go 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 get ahead get ahead strategic advantage um, but for me, I, I just wanted to ask you, like, where is the line? Like when people think of surrender, it's like it's it's almost akin to giving up. That's the energetic charge that we mm -hmm. have attached to it in the West. But I, that's not the surrender we're talking about. It's 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 getting out of your own way. So where where is the line between what one would consider surrender and apathy? Say, OK, so there's a there's a fine line very much. So sorry about the background noise. It might be something outside. Um the way I look at it, when you surrender, it's more of a an awareness. So you can give up and you can be like, oh, my God, I can't take it anymore. I'm done. Like, And you can chuck all your toys out of the pram and you'll be like, this is it, no more. And there's an anger with it. There's a real kind of like frustration and, and a hopelessness. Mm. But when you surrender, there's more of a trust. It's more you've got more of a trust that something else can take over or something else is going to have to come into your life at that point mm. and move you to the next stage. And there's this level of belief and surrendering to God or surrendering to the universe or to the magic or whatever it is that you're surrendering to. You're handing something over rather than feeling like something's been taken away mm. when you just give up. And, you know, things are taken away. You're like, OK, cool. This is, you know, this is my life now. But after giving stuff up, also surrender needs to come in because it's that transitional process where you have to realize that's acceptance. You have to have the acceptance for that moment and just know that it's not possible for you to do anything other than just let it go. Mm. And when you can let it go, that's when the magic comes in. But just giving stuff up doesn't usually work. It's, you know, when you, there's this kind of that, it's a period of time from giving stuff up and surrendering. And in between that, you don't know what's going to go on. You don't know where you're going to end up. You have no idea of what's in the unknown, which is pretty much the the kind of the interesting part where everybody fears, you know, what's going to happen? I don't know. I don't know. But we're all in that in, in the world right now. We're in this space. It's like we're kind of giving up what we had because we've had to. But there's a part where we need to surrender to what's coming. And nobody knows what's coming. So at the moment, we're terrified on a global, you know, trajectory you're looking at things and it's like oh my god where are we going but we need to learn that we don't need to know but it's got to be better than what we had because what we had globally wasn't working and like with me with my back what I had what I thought was working wasn't working and that's why it needed to be changed mm -hmm. so there's this trust and acceptance that comes with moving forward and the surrendering that I think is is the key part but we do have to just let go mm -hmm. if that makes sense oh, that's totally 
totally makes sense. And I, I want to sort of dive a little bit deeper into that, that idea of trust and uh, intuition. Uh, it says on your website that you have ignored all the people who said you need to choose just one thing and stick to it mm-hmm. uh, and that you do what you love and what feels right. So m- my question is, how have you developed that sense of trust and intuition, like to have the courage to trust yourself, um, specifically in in the face of, you know, lack of external validation or Mm -hmm. other people doubting you it's like it's very hard to to trust that voice that inner voice that you are on the right track and you're doing the right thing how did you develop that over a long period of time (laughs) there's no quick there is no quick answer to that and i would love to give you one and say hey this is how you do it but you know what i failed so many times so many times with so many things and I, you know, I remember seeing, you know, little signs and little things that made sense to me. And I'm like, really, does is that, is that what that is? Is it like a universal breadcrumb? Am I meant to follow the breadcrumbs here? Am I meant to follow that magic? And I thought, well, I've got nothing else to do. So I'm going to keep following the magic. And they first came in numbers and I kept getting the number 18 and there was lots of synchronicities with 18. Then there would be words. And there's, there's, a, there's a company around where I'm actually at my parents, where when I had my first breakdown. Actually, my only breakdown, I don't know why I said first, but maybe maybe there's another one coming. I don't know, but I hope not. Um, But when I had my breakdown, I was at my parents' house and um, I remember looking outside the window and I was thinking about, um, you know, being um, in, it was like a music note. I was thinking about being in harmony with the universe around you. And I was thinking, I wonder if, you know, I wonder if I'm in harmony now. I wonder if I'm in resonance with what's going on around me. Am I on the right vibe? Am I on the right path? And then this lorry went past my mum and dad's window. And on the lorry, there's a company. I still don't know what the company is, but it said it's on the side of the lorry. It says Symphony. And, I, and I'm and i like, what? No way. And it was just at that moment. And there's me talking all musical and saying, you know, my resonance and vibration. And then I get the Symphony lorry flying past. And I'm like, oh. Okay, well, that's talking back to me. And it was a really profound moment. I'm like, that's a, that's a sign. Mm. And I kept getting more signs, you know, even to the point where I'm like, okay, I'm going to see a yellow car today. And if I see a yellow car, like, or, you know, if I'm walking down the street and I see a yellow car, this means something's going to happen. And then I'd see six or seven yellow cars. And the chances of that happening, and people say, oh, you're bringing it into your awareness. But I don't care if you're bringing it into your awareness. The fact is it showed up when I asked for it. And mm. that is the trust. So when if I look back and I look at, you know, it's only very recently when I realized I had an addiction to YouTube, which is also <laughs> extremely, <laughs> extremely uh, bad. I was on there for 24 hours in one week. And I wow. realized that I, I, I was like, this is, needs to stop. But when I gave up looking at the YouTube and I'm thinking, damn, I need to give this up. And I'm thinking, how have I actually just figured out I've got a YouTube addiction where I thought I didn't really have any addictions other than sugar, which is something I'm still working on. But I look back and I, you know, I had an addiction to to drinking. So I gave that up. I had an addiction to drugs. So I gave them up. I had addictions to sex. So I gave that up for a period of time, not completely, but I gave it up for three years. I had an addiction to social media, gave that up. And all the times I've given something up, it served me so greatly to not go back into those scenarios, you know, or at least do it with care, like with the sex. It's making sure you're sleeping with the right partner, making sure you're actually connecting to the right person and that you're doing it from the right place and you've not got any boundaries. Mm. So there were all these things that I never really took into consideration when I was younger, Mm. but now I do. And there's a big, big difference in that, you know, looking back over my life and thinking, well, it worked back then. And all I was doing back then was following the magic, you know, and following a bit of, you know, the odd universal breadcrumb. And the more I can look back, the the stronger I realize that that's worked for me. So mm-hmm. why is it not going to work if I keep using it moving forward? So my trust comes from the fact that I've tried it time and time again, and it always leads me to a place that I'm happier in. Mm. Amazing. I love that. So uh, a couple of things that you mentioned there, that awareness, like bringing things into your awareness or versus manifesting them. Um, mm-hmm. I find that, you know, when we do... And this kind of comes back to the goals question. So for me, what I do is I have a goal in mind. Like there's things that I've tuned into that I want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and But I've released the the need to know how it's going to happen. You know, we're so programmed to know, I got to know well, you know, what's the formula? What's the strategy? What's the marketing? You know, how am I going to get ROI? Like all those things that we're trained to, to look for yeah. from a bis- business perspective. But for me, it's like, okay, well, what feels best? What feels like a good avenue towards fulfillment and success, whatever that means for you. And then once you sort of set your trajectory in that direction, 
releasing the attachment to how it's going to happen and surrendering into the trust that you're moving in that direction. And I find once you do that, because if you're stuck in the old way of just like, you know, hustle and strategy and, you know, um, yeah. striving, striving, you call it, you miss lots of things because you have the blinders on. Right. And so if you I think that what I'm trying to say is there, there's a balance between, OK, I'm going to set my trajectory, but then I'm going to surrender and allow the universe to provide. And as soon as I do that, so many more opportunities and things I would have never seen start to come into my awareness. And mm -hmm. that's where you start to get into alignment and you know you're going in the right direction. And I'm getting chills just thinking about it because that's, <laughs> that's really what this is about, you know, just like yeah. getting, getting in your flow and your dharma. Uh, that's what I wanted to ask you, actually. So living in the moment and being present is awesome, but you, you, you sort of have to have some um, navigational tune, t tool, a north star to be pointing you in some direction. So mm -hmm. what, is, what is that for you? What would you describe as like your purpose or your life's mission? So it's really good. I love how you've just arrived at that. Um, <laughs> and it's very similar journey. I, I totally get everything that you're saying. Um, so I have something called my internal nat sav. It's like a sat nav that everyone else has in their car. But it's my nat sav. <laughs> awesome. And um, she kind of knows where she's going in as much as I want to have. I want to have fun along the way. And I want to be able to do certain things. Now, I would love to make a list and say, right, I want to do this, 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 and this. And the universe goes, yes, it's like Amazon Prime delivery. Everything just turns up at once. And you're like, brilliant, I have everything. But I know that's not where the enjoyment comes from. There's limited satisfaction that comes when you're having stuff delivered all the time, when it's just in the moment. Um, and you can just get anything you want. There's no real, you know, part of you that's like, yeah, it's brilliant. I worked hard for it. You know, the reward comes in the journey. The reward comes when you've got the patience and you've put yourself forward and you're doing lots of things that need to get you there and you've really overcome a struggle of some way. And that's what I've got behind me as well is the, um, the five hindrances of Shaolin, which is the practices. It's all the things that happen before you make it to the top, not in any particular order, but that's what I look at now on a daily basis. And there's the struggles and things that I have to get over first, but I know that I'm going to a happier place and I know that I want to have fun when I get there. And I know that I need to make sacrifices today in order to get me there. But I don't ultimately have a North Star. Mm. And I used to. I used to cling on to that North Star like crazy. <laughs> but I, for me, I don't need to know where I'm going. I just know that if I do what's right, I'm going to have fun along the way and I'm going to be able to be able, you know, to be able to adapt to any situation. So I think that's the most important thing. The destination isn't isn't the priority at the moment. It's how adaptable are you? Because every single thing in life changes, regardless of whether you want it to or not. It's going to change. Things are going to break. Things are going to lose. You're going to lose stuff. Things are going to change. People are going to come. People are going to go. If you can become really flexible with your attitude towards the moment that you're in, there's no need to have a goal because you're enjoying the moments that you're in. Mm. And I used to, people used to say to me, yeah, but you must know what you want to do with work and you must know where you want to go. And as long as I'm talking, I'm happy. That's what I love doing. That's my passion is if I can research, travel, write and teach. And that comes with me talking with the teaching. That's I'm happy if I'm reading books mm. and I can write about it and I can talk to people about it and I'm traveling at the same time. I'm good. Whatever that looks like in terms of a career or a focus, I don't need to know. Mm. But I'm happy that I can do those things. And I, you know, I understand what my values are. They're the things that you spend the most time on. They're not, you know, trust and, you know, love and all these things. The, those types of values that people talk about commonly, you know, in a company says, oh, we've got a set of values that our company lives by. Values are what you spend the most time on. Mm. And uh, Dr. John D. Martini explains this very well in his books, which I, I love his work. And he says, once you've figured out your values and what you spend the most time on, you can see why it's in your life and what it is you love so much that you do it all the time. And then that will tell you where you're meant to be focusing on. Because you might you might be focusing on in your life, you might be focusing on music and making music and, you know, talking about music and doing all this stuff to do with music. But somebody says, what's your value? But like, oh, yeah, I really value my girlfriend. And but she's nowhere on your top values because mm. you're spending your time doing other things. And I've had clients that I've worked with before in the past and I've looked at all their values and we've gone through his uh, John D. Martini's test. And um, I've had them where they're like, oh, yeah, I value my girlfriend. And then she's nowhere. We've done the test, done the questions, the answers have arrived. And I'm like, 
so where's your girlfriend and they're like oh my god and you know it makes them realize that they don't actually value their girlfriend in the way that they think they should so Mm -hmm. are they with the right partner or are they making the right decisions on a daily basis and by understanding my values is that you know personal development and relationships and you know going out there and loving what I do that's really important to me so whatever it is that shows up as long as they're ticking my little value boxes I'm I'm happy there's no major goal there's no north star there's an internal one that I need to keep shining but the one outside of myself just isn't there anymore Mm, fantastic I love that um so you mentioned adaptability. That's something I want to just ask you about because I totally agree. And uh, I have kids. And so m- one of my primary goals with them, uh, raising them here in the jungle in Costa Rica, was in- wow. instilling a sense of adaptability. To mm-hmm. you know, th- And for me, that's the currency of the future. The world is changing so fast that we need to be adaptable. But my question is, do you think that's something that's trainable? Or is it just sort of inherently in some people and other people not so much? totally trainable I trained myself to become adaptable I wasn't always like this I used to grip onto any moment and you know I'd hold on to it then I'd you know if it was a bad moment I'd tell 10 friends and you know if it was a good moment I'd tell 20 and I was constantly there you know needing validation from other people and needing to be you know accepted and needed to adapt to this and that but then I wouldn't and I'd stay in that you know that space of anger for ages or that's you know whatever it was I'd hang on to it Mm. and that wasn't serving me And the more I realize I now have a bit of a trick when it comes to adapting to a situation. When things change or when you're annoyed at someone, tell one person only. Because if you tell loads of people, which women do this best, you know, if our our boyfriend's annoyed us, not that I have one, but if our boyfriend's annoyed us and we're like, oh, my God, you know, you tell one friend and then another friend and another friend and another friend and then you might tell your parents and then your sisters and then you put it on Facebook and then the... And then your boyfriend, actually, you realize that he's not a dick anymore and he's actually done something that it was probably you that's done something. You're like, oh, my God. Oops. So now you have to go and tell your 10 friends and your family. And your, it's the, the work that you have to do after an event is what keeps you stuck in that moment. If you can limit the amount of extra work you have to do, like the drawing back of information or the the repeating of telling the story 20 times because mm-hmm. this is all the people that you see for the next week. Are like, oh, yeah, last time I saw you, this happened. Is everything okay? And you have to tell the story again and again and again. And you repeat yourself. So now if anything changes in my life that's fundamentally flooring me in some way where I'm like, oh, I tell one, maybe two friends at max just to get a different perspective. One of them is usually my dad or my mom. And then I'll tell a friend. And that friend will be specifically chosen for that moment. So I'm only going to tell the friend that I know can help me in that moment because there's no point in me telling a friend that has zero idea what I'm talking about Mm. that is going to be able to give me limited advice or limited support in that moment or may not be able to help me in any way shape or form may not have Mm. a clue what I'm talking about so I became really selective with my friends and who I go to for support and that varies based on the scenario but by limiting the amount of admin work that you have to do when something happens you can learn to become very adaptable because you realize that situation can be over within minutes once you've told one person and then you only have to go back to that one person when the thing's changed again you're you're done you're moving Mm. on to the next thing but it's because we keep stuff alive we keep things alive all the time because we can't shut up and I was the greatest talker I still am like in terms of being able to like go out there and chat but now I have something more important to say whereas before blatant gossip I was a constant gossip queen and I would keep problems alive that were needed to die a long time ago yeah the ego loves drama. So. Oh, my God. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, getting wrapped up in those cyclical stories is what the ego loves. So breaking mm-hmm. out of it is is not easy, but it's it's powerful work. Good for you. Yeah. Um, so it, it says on your website as well that you are a personal responsibility coach, amongst yeah. many other things, um, mm-hmm. helping everyone from high profile DJs to tour managers. What, what does that mean exactly? What is a personal uh, responsibility coach? OK, so. Um, I hate the term life coach. So do I. <laughs> main, the main reason being is because no one has it all sussed out 24-7. Yeah. So to be a life coach, it really, I think there's an exceptional expectation on you there to have yeah. everything sussed out. And not everybody's zinging at all times. I mean, people can have good lives. But to really be you know, somebody that is a life coach, I would be expecting to see someone that is... A grade in every area. And I don't know a human like that. 
we all have our flaws because life is so various and life is so vast and so different for me in my life what worked for me the best was learning to take responsibility for my life mm. and when i learned to take responsibility for my life in many areas things started to change and get better so you could say oh yeah it's a life coach it's not i, I now help people take responsibility so the things i help them take responsibility for are finances relationships uh, their attitudes toward things their understanding of like their personal development they'll take responsibility so I, I do a day I don't know if you saw it on my site I don't know if it's still on there or I changed it it's called unfuck your life yes so, I did see that yeah so <laughs> unfuck your life is basically a day where I pin you to yourself for one day only so imagine You've got loads of emails you haven't got back to. You've got loads of WhatsApps you haven't yet replied to. You have awkward conversations you need to have. You've got some bills you need to pay. You've got stuff at home that you haven't quite done in your house. Maybe there's a box of cables somewhere that you, you know, or there's something that you need to tie up or there's something you need to pin on the wall. There's always these things all the way around us that we need to do, but we haven't yet done. And I, I wonder if I can find you this. Hold on. Bear with me one second. There's a method to my madness. Okay. So you can see here is my Lego board. And I have a little Lego man I'm going to show you. I love it. Okay, so you can see this now. So this is your life, okay? This is you, whoever my client is. The pink board is your life. Everywhere in your life, there is something that you haven't yet done or you need to do or something you forgot you need to do. So this long to-do list is hanging around you all the time. Now, we live in a void. We live in space, all the time, there's a whole void around us. Our space and our void is literally cluttered with all these things that we haven't yet done. And we're like, oh, God, I've got to do that. Oh, got to do that. So every time you feel like, oh, I need to do something, haven't yet done it, that feeling where you get, oh, is literally a block. It's an energy block. Mm -hmm. So usually I put Lego all the way on the board. So I'll have it. Yeah, you haven't replied to your WhatsApp. That's one block. And then you haven't replied to your bills. That's another block. And we'll pile this board up with Lego pieces. So you can physically see from this board, all the Lego pieces and all the blocks that you've got in your life. So this little man can't go anywhere. This is usually like some kind of man or some character, whoever chooses whatever bag that the, uh, the Lego person comes in. But today it's just this little dude here. And right now he's got loads of space in his life because he's done everything on his to-do list. Mm. Now, once you do everything on your to-do list, you start feeling pretty complete. You're like, yeah, I've done that. And I've got that out of the way. And I've done this and I've done that. You start to feel accomplished. You can actually look at your life with a bit of pride because you know you've completed the things you needed to complete. You're not ignoring anyone anymore. You're not avoiding anything anymore. You've actually dealt with all of the things on your to-do list. Once you've moved all that basic stuff, which is just adulting 101, once you've actually completed that stuff, you can then sit back and say, right, well, do I still have the mental health issue that I thought I had? Or actually, was that just because I'm avoiding everything? Because once you've faced everything, you're a new version of you. Mm. So I get people to look at their life and say, right, what are you avoiding? You're avoiding something. It'll be as simple as WhatsApp. So then we have to look at why you're avoiding them. Or you haven't done your emails. Why haven't you done your emails? Every single part of what you're avoiding can be broken down, can be looked at, can be done and cleared out of the way. And then when you clear it out of the way, all you're left with is you. And if you know at the very end of it that you're just you – you can be anything you want to be because you've got nothing standing in your way. So mine is more about getting you to take personal responsibility for the things that you avoid. And then once you do that, you can you can go get yourself a life coach if you, want, if you really want. You can go and then create a new version of yourself. But I get people to the place where they're like, ah, I'm actually human. and I haven't adulted properly and maybe I should. Mm. That's, the, that's the point where I think the magic happens because you can really – get a lot of fundamental awareness. And when you start, when you, you know, when, I don't know if you, if I said like the term self-love to you, what would you say self-love is for you? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, for a lot of people, it just means, you know, binging on Netflix with a glass of wine or sitting in a hot tub yeah. or something, you know, and that's not what it means to me. Um, uh, taking responsibility, definitely. Yeah. Um, taking care of my body, taking care mm -hmm. of what go, what, what I ingest on every level, be that yeah. food, drink, media, people, energy, that's what self-love is to me. Exactly. So the way I describe it is, for me, the way I look at self-love is that it's a decision that you make every moment of every day for mm. the future version of you. Mm. So if you really loved yourself, would you eat that cake? 
If you really loved yourself, would you be hanging around with that person? If you really loved yourself, would you just still stay in bed and not get up before, you know, 10? It's these decisions. If you can keep making constant decisions in the moment that serve a greater version of yourself, you're loving yourself into that person. And when you get to that point of being, oh, yeah, I'm the one that now has abs and, you know, that I'm doing really well and I'm, you know, I'm feeling great and I've been getting up really early. You love yourself because you made those decisions before. Mm. So for me, the way I look at doing personal responsibility is if I can show people where they don't love themselves, where they have no idea that they don't love themselves, they don't realize that ignoring their millions of WhatsApps is actually an act you know, against them being a greater version of themselves. If I can get them to look around their life and realize what they're not taking responsibility for, then they can tackle that and then they have a chance of being able to say, yeah, I did a really good job today because they're starting to learn to love themselves because they showed up mm. for themselves. Mm, yeah. So a couple of things came up for me there is I totally agree with you taking responsibility uh, for the things you need to do. Uh, but it, if you come ever from the place where, OK, if I eat this piece of cake, I don't love myself. There's a there's a danger of falling into shame there. Yeah, shaming totally. Yourself. Yeah. totally. That was just an example. Yeah. But it, it's a decision that if you know that it's not going to be great for you because yeah. you're working towards a different goal. Yeah. You need to look at why you're taking it. I'll eat cake till the cows come home. Like, <laughs> and, I, and I know sometimes I shouldn't. And I'll say to myself, nah, that wasn't very loving. That wasn't very kind. There's no shame there. It's just yeah. next Awareness. time I shouldn't really have two slices. I should have one. Or, yeah. you know, it's that self-guidance. But shame is such an important thing as well. That You know, the work of Brene Brown, which I love her. She's amazing. Shame is so important for us to understand that we, you know, that we live in many, many dark clouds of shame. Mm. Many, many dark clouds of shame. But a little bit of shame sometimes is a driving factor for you as for well. Sure. Yeah. And it's, we don't all want to be in shame all the time. And we don't want, you know, the shame from other people. But if we can get comfortable with ourselves because we know we're doing the right thing, there's less shame mm-hmm. because we're owning it. But if we don't own it, that, you know, that's where it really becomes a problem. Mm. So it's interesting to me that your process, and I, I think it's amazing that you uh, are helping people take stock of their life and be accountable and be responsible for everything. I think that's super important. Um, with my clients, I tend to do it the opposite way, though. I invite them to look underneath the hood first. Because mm-hmm. you know, if they're looking at the problems in their life and they don't know what the genesis, what the unconscious motivator or the pattern or the shadow yeah. or whatever is causing it in the first place, cleaning it up might work in the moment, but it's the mess is just going to arrive again. Mm-hmm. Right. So, you know, for me, it's like, OK, let's let's look at what's going on underneath the surface. Is there shame? Is there not enoughness, unworthiness? You know, is there trauma? Is there whatever, mm-hmm. you know, name it um, to bring that to the surface? Because then, you know. And for me, I work with a lot of people um, around addiction. And so alcohol for a lot of my clients is just a symptom. You know, yeah. it's just it's a symptom that they're they're numbing out from some pain or something that they don't want to deal with. It's not that mm-hmm. they're an alcoholic or they're addicted. You know, there's, of course, people that are addicted. But um, more often than not, it's something that's happening beneath the surface. And maybe this is a great segue, actually, because you um, gave up chemical drugs in, drugs in 2011 and gave up mm-hmm. alcohol in 2014. And you're still sober. So that's. Yeah. First of all, congratulations. That's incredible. Uh, but I'd love to hear more about that journey because I think it might be super relevant to my audience. Like, how did you manage to do that? Mm-hmm. So going back to what you said about um, the way you work with your clients, mm. for me, I needed to – What the, the best thing I realized was how much alcohol had an effect on my whole life. So until I fully looked at every area of my life, which is how I learned the responsibility coaching with myself, is – I didn't realize how big the problem was. I just thought when I started talking about having the problem and, you know, maybe it's because I'm lonely or maybe it's this, you know, I was getting to, yes, the root of the problem, but it was popping up at other places at other times. If I just cleared it all at once and realized actually where it was connected to, I kind of had a list with myself that I could go into and say, right, well, it's attached to that, 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 that. I can see how big the problem is now. So it was more of an awareness driver from my Mm. angle when I do it with that way. But, um, so I, um, I gave up, so very uh, honest story here. I was in Ibiza and I was at a place called Pikes, which is a hotel it's where they film club, uh, filmed Club Tropicana. And I was there with a guy and I remember that we, he'd said to me, oh, you know, I was out in Ibiza already and he said, I'll come out and why don't we spend a few days together? 
we'd been sleeping together on and off for about five years uh, whenever we used to go out clubbing whenever we'd have drugs it was that kind of thing um and but we never quite got it any further and he said to me why don't I come out and spend some time with you and we'll just see what you know what this is type thing so we decided that we weren't really going to drink anything as such we weren't going to do any drugs that was it we were going to drink but we weren't going to do any drugs and then I saw an old friend of mine that came to the poolside and said oh hey Nat how are you you know I've not seen you for ages I said yeah yeah I'm good I'm just with my friend and um he said oh Nat I've got this amazing acid and I'm like never done acid before and I looked at my friend and I said oh he's got this acid and he said oh oh, really and I was like we're not meant to be doing anything and he's like I've never had acid either and I'm like me neither should we just (laughs) so we did acid and uh we had a great night obviously as most times you do on acid and um but this was my first ever time and uh I sat in a mirror in this uh suite where we were in this beautiful hotel and we just finished having sex and he fell asleep out cold and I'm sat in this mirror looking at myself being like this is amazing and I was listening to the XX album and uh and it was crystallized was on and I remember looking in the mirror and I just you know everyone's saying don't look in the mirror when you're on acid and I'm thinking why not so I was just staring at myself and I've had a, a real relationship with myself in the mirror for many years but which is another story but I looked at myself in the mirror and that my higher version like my higher self of me came out of the mirror looked straight at me and said you can give up taking drugs now. You're never going to get higher than this. And I'm just like, okay. And it was like I told myself enough was enough. Like I'd reached my peak because I was in absolute ecstasy. I'm just at the point where, you know, you just feel like you're almost going to blow up. And it was brilliant and amazing. And I was done. And I thought, mm-hmm. okay, this is this going to last? Is this not? So I can remember saying to myself, you know, if it if it's meant to be, I'll stick to it. And it was, I got offered a few, you know, a few different things after that. And I was like, no, it's not really going to reach that night because I remembered how good it was. And I was thinking, it's not really going to reach that. It's not going to reach that. And, you know, every time somebody would offer something, I'd end up saying no. But then I was drinking more because you swap Mm. one for the other. So because I wasn't going out and taking the drugs, I was definitely drinking more. And then I started drinking more wine. Then I was drinking whiskey and um, everything. And I was working in a clubbing environment as well. So it wasn't ideal and I remember a few years after um, writing a list of things to myself. And it was just like a, a time in my head where it was like, write down all the things in your life that you're not happy with or have buggered up, basically. So I thought, right. So I got myself my A4 paper and I went down with my pen. And I started writing down one side of the lined paper. And then I wrote down on the other side of the lined paper. And then I turned this bit of A4 paper over. And then I started writing some more lists down and some more lists. And I got to the bottom of this, like, you know, four columns on an A4 sheet of paper. I think it was like 30, 30 things on each other. So, so many things I'd written down. And I'm like, oh, I need more paper. And as I'm going to get more paper, it was like my higher self was like, uh, no, you need to go back to that bit of paper and see what's happening. So I was like, oh. So I put my pen down and I sat with this bit of paper. And I looked and I'm thinking every single time that there's a major problem in here, it's got to do with alcohol. Like I, it's had some form of connection with alcohol. And I was like, wow, this is a major, major problem that I didn't know I had. And that's why I find lists so powerful. I get my clients to exhaust their mind of lists of things that uh, that they need to do basically everything you need to do dump it on a list in this way and I have a specific order I work with but it gets them to exhaust their mind and once they've put everything down in front of them then they're like oh this is actually a problem because look how big it is and I'm looking at it now and I can see it in front and then I I get to them you know to put on the lego board I'm like right well you've got 22 drug problems add 22 blocks to the thing so they're sticking the blocks of lego and it's endless and it's tiresome so they really have little castles that they get to see in the end on this lego where they're like oh my god these are all my problems so i i did that with myself it wasn't with the lego but it was with the list and i thought this needs to stop something needs to change so because i'd made myself aware how great the problem was I realized I had like this self-awareness. I knew enough. I wasn't really going to get caught out because I'd covered the entire problem 
in one session and I'd been I'd fully accepted how big it was it wasn't like it was going to creep up anywhere else but I didn't know that at the time so mm-hmm. when I gave up um I remember a few of my friends were saying you can just have one or why don't you know just it's you know it's all about balance and I'm like go away I'm trying to quit here it's not helping me <laughs> and it really made me it really made me see other people for what they were around me it really made me see how uncomfortable I made them because I was making life choices that I didn't want to drink and I'm saying no. So the amount of times you say no highlights how many times they say yes, just by default, just by you being in the same bar and having the same conversations. So if they're feeling uncomfortable about what they're drinking or about their own habits, you become like this stylo highlighter that's there in the room, like, hey, here's all your problems and I've not got any. But it's not that you haven't got any, it's just that you're now making sure you don't want to have any. So you highlight these problems even more for other people where it can become really uncomfortable. And that's usually when you change your friends, usually where you change your um, surroundings. Um, But what I realized very early on, you can't avoid the places that you go to drink. And because if you do that, you're just going back into avoidance and you're not really healing the problem. Mm. So if you can still go to the bar and you can still say no, you don't have a problem anymore. But if you're just avoiding the place and that's not where you're going to go because you can't trust yourself in that place, you haven't solved the problem. Yes, you might not be drinking and your life might be getting better, but there is a chance at some point that will catch you out again. But if you can learn from the very beginning how great your problem is, how much of a you know a mess you're actually in because you've looked under every single connection it possibly has, because you've exhausted yourself, you get to that point where you're like, oh, okay, well, I got myself into this, so I'm the only one I can get myself out of it. And because you've got that great understanding in your mind, it's easier for you to to manage that. And I've done that with many people that have been drinking. And I wouldn't call myself an a, an addiction expert because I don't really like the word expert. I'm a you know if I'm an expert in anything, it's an expert in myself, and I know what doesn't work for me. And it just so happens that everything I've done for myself works for other people too when I help them. Um, but they have their own way of doing it they have their own analogies that come up their own understandings they kind of like self-help themselves um because they adopt the problem and they take it on straight away they don't believe that the problem's outside of themselves it's like oh yeah that's mine so they can't get away from themselves if that makes sense oh absolutely that was beautiful i I totally agree with uh so many things that you said there it's really about cultivating self-awareness and becoming aware of everything uh, that's going on in your life. But I, what I've found for myself definitely and for a lot of my clients is even if you have that self-awareness, you're aware that alcohol is negatively affecting your life or drugs or whatever vice it, it you know, fill in the blank, shopping, porn. Um, even if you have the awareness, uh, it, it's difficult because your identity, and this was definitely true for me, has been so ingrained. Like I, when I, I'm an Irish Catholic. I grew up drinking. My whole family drank. We went to the pub. That's what you do. Right. And so, you know, me imagining a life without alcohol didn't make sense to me. So even if I cognitively, intellectually knew that, wait a minute, this is not helping me anymore. It's not serving me anymore. How do I live without it? All my friends drink, all my family drinks, you know, everybody, everywhere I go, you know, so um, Mm -hmm. sort of removing myself from that was very difficult and painful. And I think that's a reason a lot of people don't do the work is because they can't imagine going through that pain and, or can't even see the other side to even yeah. take the first step towards that pain. Um, but you're so right that becoming aware of it and having the courage to look at your addictions or your vices or the places that mm-hmm. you're numbing out is the first step. And getting support absolutely is another step. And because really what we do is we hold up the mirror for each other. It's like you can't, totally. see, can't see the blind spots in your own yeah. awareness, right? And so, you know, having somebody, a friend, a mentor, a coach, whoever it is, a loved one to hold up the mirror for you and ask you the difficult questions that you might mm-hmm. not be asking yourself is another way to do it. Hey, are you feeling lost, frustrated, angry about the state of the world, but unsure what to do about it? I get it. The world is a pretty messed up place right now. Yet in these interesting times of shattered realities, many people are using alcohol to escape and numb their feelings of anxiety, dread, and uncertainty. I know. I did it for years. This is why I've made it my mission to support brave souls in mastering their inner world and finding a deeper sense of purpose. To that end, I created Reset 2020. Reset is a personal transformation mastermind group with the intention of resetting your relationship with alcohol and becoming the best version of yourself in an empowering, supportive online community. 
To check out more about Reset 2020 and to watch my masterclass video, head on over to go.patrickcooklife.com. Remember, cook is spelled with an E, C-O-O-K-E. So it's go.patrickcooklife.com. All right, now back to the show. Awesome. So around self-awareness, I wanted to ask you about, you also mentioned that you gave up sex for three years. So what was that about? And what did you learn from that experience? (laughs) Sorry, it just cut out very quickly then for like two seconds. I couldn't hear you. So you have to repeat yourself. I was like, oh, what happened here? (laughs) Oh, Uh, no, I want. I, I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, the self awareness around why you gave up sex and what did you learn from those three years of abstinence. Well, great one. Um, okay, so when it comes to the subject of sex, the main thing I realized was for me when I made the list, when I'd done the long list of everything, a lot of it involved men of the opposite sex. And, you know, I was just like, oh, okay, cool. There's a lot here that I'm not fundamentally happy that I've slept with. Am I proud of it? No. Is it something I want to really talk about? No. You know, could I have done better? Yes. Should I have drunk that much? No. And I had all of these connections to do with sex. And um, I thought to myself, if I wasn't drinking, would I still be having the same kind of connections? It was just a curious thought. So I thought if I don't have any alcohol for a while, um, we'll see how I go. So I started doing this no alcohol thing. And then I realized, I thought, well, you know, I'm not really going out. And because I know I'm not drinking, I'm not really attracting the same kind of scenarios. So I'm I'm not really pulling in the same sort of guys, if any, because I wasn't really um, going out for that. So then I'm thinking, well, maybe I could give up sex for a while and see see how that goes. And um, I was thinking, it's not like I'm having the greatest sex of my life. So it's not like I'm giving up anything that's amazing. It's it's not necessarily working for me. And that could be better. So what can be better than that? Just me continuing on and seeing what I can do and uh, seeing if I can pull in anything else. So I had this agreement with myself that while I wasn't drinking, I wouldn't be having sex also for a period of time because I thought I might go back to drinking at some point. I didn't realize I'd be so kind of dead against it. Um, But at the time, I thought maybe I'll drink again at some point and maybe I'll make better decisions. So not having both of them, I then, you know, all those feelings that you've been hiding from your whole life that you've been drinking away and that you've been avoiding yourself with just come up and you're like, oh, my God, (laughs) that you've opened the volcano and you've basically decided for the volcano to go off. You were you're the one that's timed it. Now you're having to deal with what comes up. And all of this stuff was coming up about my my massive addiction to attention. I have a Mm. massive, well, I had a massive addiction to attention. Um, Not so much anymore at all. Um, And that changed also with when I gave up the um, social media. But it was, I didn't know I had an addiction to attention or drama or anything else. So by not drinking and not having sex, I realized I had these other two addictions here with drama and attention. So I'm pulling out all of these bits and pieces of myself and being like, wow, this is intense. No one's going to want to sleep with me because <laughs> I'm nuts. And I started thinking if I and I'd fallen in love with somebody around the same time um, that I couldn't end up being with. And unfortunately, we went through a, a whole scenario. And um, but I loved him so much. And I thought, well, even if, you know, even if I can't have him and I meet someone like him, Um, I want to be the best version of myself so I can give him the best version of myself because that's Mm. what he deserves. And he was kind of like my my guiding um, light. If I ever had a North Star, it would have been him in the fact that that's where I'm kind of going in that direction, not necessarily for him, but that kind of love and that feeling that I had for him, that's what I wanted to obtain. And I knew that I couldn't take all of this version of myself that I was in that star of the North Direction, sorry, the North Star direction um, with all of that baggage because it, I was never going to get there. I'd been weighing myself down. So I then had a bit of a driving factor um, of improving myself to draw in the right kind of guy. But then I found Pornhub and um, I got lost on Pornhub for a considerable <laughs> amount of time. And uh, so I was still having the gratification, the kind of that angle of the, you know, the 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 instant need being met, but there was mm-hmm. no intimacy around it. 
but it was my comfort zone. And it's very, very hard to give up something that's so satisfying, immediately satisfying when you've given up everything else. Because then your mind's like, oh, well, you've given up drugs and you've given up alcohol, uh-huh. and you're not having proper sex and you're not eating as many Snickers as you were before and you're not doing this, you're not doing that. So yeah, it's fine. You can go on Pornhub because that's your reward for the day. So I had this internal fucked up reward system that also didn't serve me because my ego needed something because she needed a lifeline back then because I was trying to get rid of every part of her and um, realizing that she's never going to go anywhere by the way Um, but at the time I was really hard you know working hard on myself in so many different ways emotionally and then I watched a a TED talk um, of a guy saying why I no longer watch porn and uh, I was like oh my god I'm addicted to porn. So I had to literally, I stopped immediately with the most amount of shame you could have ever imagined. And I talk about it now and I'm like, okay, but honestly, like knowing that I was like, oh my God, this is like something I, you know, something I thought was for other people realizing I was the other person. Um, And I thought, shit, this is not good. So I couldn't tell anyone. Because who can you tell? That like, oh yeah, hi, hey, I've not spoke to you for a while. Yeah, so I'm addicted to Pornhub. I'm not going <laughs> to happen. You're not going to have that conversation. So it was something I internally went to the mirror with. So I, I have this big relationship with the mirror. And I talk to myself in the mirror all the time. And it saved me thousands of pounds on therapy. But I don't believe that anybody knows any better than you do internally. If you give yourself the space and the time mm. to really ask yourself and you're willing to hear what's said, and act on it, then you can you can heal yourself. And this conversation that I have with myself in the mirror, you know, this version of me in the mirror is just one thing. There's a higher version of me that pops out when I've had acid or pops out, you know, at other at times in my life that tells me what I need to hear. And if I'm willing to listen, can guide me in the right direction. So I took this shameful, embarrassing Pornhub scenario to the mirror. And uh, and I just sat there and I, and I remember I was sat in the mirror naked. And I was looking at myself and I'm just like, okay, right, there's nothing wrong with how you look. You're okay. You've given up drugs. You've given up alcohol. You're okay. You're doing good. Yet you're feeling rejection. And I was giving myself this pep talk and I'm sat there thinking, oh my God. And I had saw all of myself and I just cried like a bitch. And I was just like, oh my God, this is horrible. But I remember looking in the mirror and it was like my higher self was like, enough. And I just thought, enough, enough of what? Enough of Pornhub or enough of what? Like, Have you had enough? And I was like, no. She said, well, cry some more. And I cried and I cried and I cried and I cried and I cried. And I'm thinking, what is this? And I just kept crying. And then again, I looked in the mirror and it was just like, all right, now I'm done crying. So I got out all the shame and all the stuff that I needed to get out in that moment for so like there was so many years of shame and guilt and being a bit of a slut that I was when I was younger that I had to bring to the forefront in that day and just accept myself and cry it out because no one was coming to save me and the exhausting part of it was that I got to the bottom of that in that moment where anything else that came after that wasn't anywhere near as bad but I faced it and I remember thinking to myself no matter what problem you have no matter how hard life is, no matter how fucked up your situation is, the worst thing that will ever happen to you is you'll cry a little bit harder than you did before. We all just cry. That's as far as it goes. We hate crying. We don't want to go there. We don't like the trauma. But at the end of the day, what happens when you go to trauma? What happens when you go to the darkest part of yourself? You cry. Mm. And I'm thinking, I'm scared of a bit of water rolling down my face. I know it doesn't feel great, but that's the as bad as it gets. And, I, you know, I was thinking of all the stories and all the scenarios and I'd been abused before and I'd had horrific relationships and all this stuff. Every time I'd had a fucked up situation, I cried. And I'm thinking, oh, well, if I just have to cry. And then it was like an invitation. I didn't stop crying for almost two years. I cried every single day. If I needed to cry about anything, it came out and it was so cathartic. Everything was coming out. I started healing myself, but I wasn't drinking wasn't doing drugs, wasn't addicted to Pornhub. And the guys that I was meeting when I was out, I was vetting them. I was taking actual care because I was thinking, well, do I, is that what I want? I'm not sleeping with that. No way. Or, you know, you know, just looking and vetting and being like, 
yeah, you're nice, but you're not quite what, you know, if I'd have had a drink in the past and you smelt nice and you danced well and you made me laugh, I'm yours. Like that was what I was. <laughs> and that isn't, that isn't really, you know, that's not who I wanted to be. Yeah. So I had to change that. So obviously I was vetting guys and I'm thinking, nah, nah, not really, not really my type. And it really took me a long time until I actually finally slept with someone. And when I did, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, oh, my God, it's going to be, like, amazing, like a Titanic moment. No, nah, not at all. But it wasn't, like, it wasn't what it used to be. And I was mm. present. And I can remember it all. I didn't forget anything. I know the guy's name. I still have his number. And I still talk to him because we're still friends. Um, so all the things that weren't there before were now present. It wasn't the most amazing sexual chemistry of my life. But I actually got to a space where I was having sex consciously. Um, and that was a big difference for me. So I knew I'd done enough. Um, and then now if I, you know, meet someone or connect with someone, I I really do look at it like if we're not, like, I'm very honest about my connections, which some guys do find uncomfortable, but then they laugh about, and I haven't got anybody that I don't speak to. Like I'm friends with all of the guys that I've met. And there's not that there's loads, but if we've had a connection, it's because we're friends first. And that's what's important to me. Oh my god, that was so awesome! I was just, I was just. <laughs> but they're like, who is this weirdo? <laughs> oh no, I love it! You're so entertaining, you're so wise, and so much value in everything you just said there. Like, I wrote down a bunch of notes, and I want to ask you about all of them. But uh, go uh, for it. <laughs> so but, you see me? I'm looking, and I'm like, I look really red, but I think it's that. That's a bit better light. There we yeah, go. Yeah, you look great. You look great. Okay. Um, so I think what we're really talking about is like what the work you've done in in becoming self-aware is peeling back the layers, you know, mm -hmm. peeling back the layers of your conditioning, of your trauma, of your emotional wounds, of your addictions and just seeing everything for what it is. And that takes yeah. tr tremendous courage. So I just want to applaud yeah. you for, for doing that work because it, it it's Thank difficult you. and it's painful as fuck sometimes, right? Oh, it's awful. It's like <laughs> literally awful. And people, no wonder people hide from themselves and run for themselves. Yeah. Obviously, like there's no one can judge me more than I judge myself. Totally. And, and that's the bit. And, you know, and I'm going to cry my ass off about whatever happens next but it's okay because i've cried yeah. before i have that certificate i'm qualified yeah. to cry i can cry like a bitch and i got through that and i'll get through it again so that's how i really look at life is it's as only as bad as as, as you want to cry mm. and you allow yourself to have that allow yeah. that, the energy to move through you you know mm -hmm. un, unblocked and that, that's really yeah. what this is about is uh, recognizing that energy wants to move and not pushing it away because it's uncomfortable or painful, yeah. let it, letting it move through you and then distilling the wisdom of why it's there in the first place. Right? Totally. So, yeah. The mirror is so important. But like The mirror work for me has been a game changer because yeah. you can't lie to yourself. I mean, you can lie yeah. to yourself. It's pointless. But if you lie to yourself in the mirror, you're like, oh, God, if you're lying to yourself, you're lying to everyone. So you can yeah. really catch yourself out. You don't have totally. to sit there naked. That was just what I did that day. But um, <laughs> <laughs> you kind of get one. <laughs> but not everybody has to but it really i think it adds an, an extra layer to the onion when you can sit there naked and you're in acceptance and you're like oh, full you surrender know. absolutely yeah totally and yeah. you're gonna look shit so just get over it <laughs> yeah for me it's not the mirror it's meditation is what does it for me because yeah, it, it's, it's, it's 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 sitting with myself absent mm -hmm. of external stimuli it's like yeah it, it's just me and myself you know let's let's be honest what's there and, yeah. and be okay with whatever's there, you know, have the courage to go into those dark corners of your soul and just, you know, see what's there with curiosity and love mm -hmm. and compassion. Because yeah. so, mu so much of us are we're encouraged to, to shame those parts of ourselves, to disown those parts of ourselves. And I think what we're really talking about is like, it's, it's an ego death where we're just allowing those parts of us to die away that no longer serve us, mm -hmm. you know, that, that we were so attached to before and they became our identity. So that's yeah. why it's, it's so painful because we feel like we're giving up who we are, but really it's just, those are addictions or traumas or beliefs or whatever they are. And once you let those go, you become who you truly are, which you were talking about as a higher self or, you know, yeah. which is absolutely beautiful. Uh, I want to be cognizant of your time, but I do have a few more questions. Um, uh, go, I've, I've got all the time in the world. It's <laughs> eight o'clock here in the evening. There's nothing else in the agenda, so you can keep Wait, me going. You don't have, have a date. Water. You don't have go a date for... tonight. No, no. Nah. <laughs> I mean, what day? What day of the week are we on? Is this like, hold on, what day of the week is it today? It's uh, oh, that day where I don't have any more dates yet. Yeah, that uh, right. day, right, right, right. Yeah, nothing going on. Like, I am actually um, single and. 
I'm not on any dating apps. I'm not on any social media. The chances of me meeting someone, I've narrowed it down. There's a tiny chance of me meeting someone. But I, uh, I've done that specifically because I really, I just wanted to pull in something that was of quality. And it, not, it just being on social media and being available, and being, I just didn't, it didn't work for me. So mm. I've just hidden away from the world and the right guy will show up. Awesome. I love it. Hopefully. Um, so so <laughs> uh, among the many hats that you wear between personal responsibility coach and your unfuck your finances or unfuck your money, um, yep. you also have a radio show called I Am Sound. I do. It's a radio station. A radio station. Excuse yeah, me. So I'd love, love to hear more about that. And um, there's sound and energy and vibration healing involved in yeah, it as well? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So um, I Am Sound was born out of me going on my personal development journey over the last 10 years that I've just explained to you and realizing that sound popped up everywhere. Vibration, sound, energy, harmony, resonance, da, 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 da. wherever I went on my spiritual path, whether it was looking at the ancient history, whether it was looking at architecture, looking at sacred geometry, looking into uh, music therapy, all that kind of stuff, everything related to sound. And if in the beginning, when I actually fully started this journey, if somebody would have said to me, right, this is sound, this is what sound is, it has relationship to the universe, and you're made of energy, and this kind of works together, maybe that would have helped me, and it would have saved me a lot of time. But nobody ever did that. I just went on this random journey. So I thought, why not teach people about sound? And if they can fully understand sound, they, they'll get the energy thing, they'll get the synchronicities, they'll get the vibration. So I thought of putting this together and um, I created a membership and we had a, and it's obviously we're not on social media. We don't have any social media at all um, because I don't believe in it. I think it's one of the worst things on the planet um, and it's really, it's not where I want to put my message out. So I thought, how do I do this? So I thought um, we'll have this membership and we'll go down the corporate route and we'll start putting it to corporate companies for their staff. And then COVID hit. And in the meantime, we had loads of stuff planned for loads of festivals in London and in and around uh, the UK. We were all the different music festivals. And we had this really amazing agenda of loads of events for people coming to see us. And um, COVID hit. And I was like, oh, this is a bit annoying. Um, not sure what I'm going to do. And then I came home to my parents' house, which is where I am now. And, um, and I've actually got these letters here. I don't know if I told you this. Um, but I write letters to myself. And then I write on the front of these letters, I put them in colored envelopes. And then I basically write on the front when I should open it. So when I got back to my parents' house, I was talking to one of my uh, investors and we're like talking about what I should do. And I looked in my drawer and all my stuff from when I moved back from Ibiza and I broke my back had been dumped in this drawer. And I pulled out this list of envelopes and I'm like, oh, so I looked on the front and one of them said, I am building this radio show. I am open in two years on the 17th of March, 2020. But it was the 18th of March when I looked and I'm just like, no way, I'm a day late. Let me open it. So I opened this letter and um, in there was me describing my dream radio because I had radio production training in the background uh, in the past, sorry. And I'd done a few other radio shows. I actually had a show, a breakfast show on Cafe Mambo in Ibiza. So I got my experience and I thought, oh, I love, you know, I don't like being a DJ. I love playing music and I love playing um, like track selection and stuff, but I don't like playing out as on decks and everything. Mm. So I thought maybe this can combine my love of music in with my love of talking radio. Here we go. So I decided to launch a radio station and um, do it all from home here in the fourth bedroom. And I set it all up. It took me seven weeks from start to finish, all on my own, built everything on my own. And I didn't realize I had that in me. It was a real, you know, massive achievement where I was like, wow, I've done this, you know, myself. And I thought, I'm going to put it out there and we're only going to have music on the station that makes me have goosebumps because then people are going to be like, oh, I love this music. And so I did that, but I thought, how do I program it? And I thought I'll program it like the best day ever. So you wake up in the morning and you've got the sound of the birds and then you've got some meditation music. Then you've got your yoga music. Then you're in your kind of heart space, chilled music in the morning. Then it's a breakfast show um, with me and my friends. And then in the afternoon, it kind of pumps up a little bit more. You've got really cool dance music, like Ibiza house music and some techno from some big DJs that I know of. And um, and then in the evenings, more talks focused. We've got some kids stuff um, 
which is the kids stuff in the evening is like being grateful. So it's uh, teaching them how to be grateful and telling them like fun stories. And then um, there's talk stuff. And then we've got um, sound healing in the evenings, which we're programming more of. So you'd have like a sound healing um, conversation and a meditation and exploration or just maybe a sound bath or some kind of therapeutic stuff. And then in the evening, it's all to do with sleep and binaural beats and all that Mm. kind of stuff. So it's everything that I wanted in a day incorporated into one program in the station. Um, I'm bringing on lots of partners now. Um, It's getting bigger and better. um, And we're just fine tuning everything. Uh, but for me, I, I thought, how do I bring back this membership? So now I've got the station. How do I bring back the membership angle? So I have, I'm kind of 50 of the way, 50% of the way through. I'm developing an, an introductory course that is going to the likes of Big Direct Line, which is a big insurance company in the UK. It's got Coots Bank, um, loads of other banks that I know of. And we're taking this course that I've put together And it's my method. It's the self method. So it's sound, energy, lifestyle and freedom. So Mm, I've trained that that and I put this together and it's being developed for the course. And the course is um, a four week course. And week one, you learn all about sound, what it is, all the, um, the words and the understandings and the basics of it. Then you learn about energy the second week, third week, how your lifestyle, so where, where in your lifestyle can you change things that accommodate the sound and the energy so you fully start to make changes in the physical world. That's going to bring in all the unfuck your life stuff that I do. And then the last one is the freedom because um, unless you've been under a rock for a very long period of time, we are in a very um, strange place in the world right now and not enough people understand that they have to heal themselves first before we can mm. save this planet. And I thought if if I get everybody on a as many people as I can understanding sound, energy, lifestyle, we can create our freedom. We can actually look and go, all right, my goodness, we need to change this and we need to change this. But actually, we can do that because we've changed ourselves. So Mm -hmm. it's taking people on this personal journey and helping them realize that if we really want to stand up in any way, shape or form against whatever it is that's out there that we feel like is, is against us at the moment, we have to know what game we're in. We have to know right now it's a vibrational war. That's what you want to call it that many people are talking about. Right now, we don't have the power because we don't understand what we're made of. We don't understand what our true power is. We don't understand the power of consciousness. We don't understand the the principles around that. But if we did, we had the education on that. A lot more people would be making the right decisions for themselves, which brings them into a higher place. They're less affected by what's going on around them. They can concentrate. They can be more stable. They can feel like at least they've got some form of sanity in amongst this crazy place that we're in. And from that place, we could maybe come together and do something that is never heard of, but completely unseen before and that can maybe change the game if we're coming from a place of love and we get it. We really get why that's important rather than just saying, yay, it's love and light. It's more like, I get it. I need to raise my vibe. Mm. Oh my God. That was so fantastic. And I totally agree with you. The The way to change the world is by healing ourselves first and then mm-hmm. coming together in community. Just yeah. Fantastic. I think that might be a great place to stop. Thank you so much, Nat, for everything. This has been amazing. Uh, I love your vibe. I love everything you're doing. Tell people Thanks. where they can find you and to reach out to you. Yeah, um, you have to dig around. You have to go to my website uh, because I don't have any social media. So you can find me. My personal website is nat at, uh, sorry, that's my email address. I'm going to say nat at, where's nat at dot com is my email address if anybody wants me. Um, But my personal email, my personal website is where's nat at dot com. And then my company one is I am sound academy dot com. And I'm available 24 seven. You can drop me an email. Fantastic. This has been so much fun. We'll definitely have to do it again. I love Love it. Love to. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much for your time today, Nat. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. You're doing an amazing job and Uh uh, keep going with your podcast. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please do hit the subscribe button and share this episode with all your friends. And for more episodes and show notes, head on over to being-podcast.com. We'll see you next time. And remember, live your being.